Hello, um, everyone. Uh, you're welcome back. Sorry for the um, abrupt end of the previous uh, previous video. There was a power outage. Um, but I was explaining, right? I was explaining that um, in order to have a ring, okay, you don't need to have multiplicative commutativity, okay? Now that you need to have a multiplicative identity in R, the ring, um, nor do you need to have a multiplicative inverse, okay? Those are not um, requirements. If, if you have multiplicative commutativity, then the ring is a special type of a ring and it's called a commutative ring, okay? Also, do not assume that the elements of a ring have multiplicative inverses. So that's what I just said. They need not for them to qualify as a ring, okay? So for example, suppose that R here is a ring and that you have A, B, C, X as elements in R. If A is not equal to zero and A, B is equal to A, C, okay? We cannot conclude that B is equal to C, okay? So that is, that is important. If, if um, remember that if A, B, if A, B is equal to A, is equal to A, C, right? For, for B to be equal to um, C, I need to multiply by the, by the inverse of A, right? on both sides, okay? In order for this to cancel, uh, where is, this is B. In order for this to cancel that, this to cancel that, then I can say B is equal to C. But in a ring, I don't need to have multiplicative inverse. So this does not need to be there. And so I can't conclude straight away that B must be equal to C, okay? So you have to be careful about this. This, this you can do it, you know, when you're dealing with um, um, the set of real numbers, right? That we, we know already. But when you are dealing with rings, you don't need that, okay? Um, not necessarily, I should say. Uh, similarly, if you have x squared equals x, we cannot conclude that x is zero or x is one, okay? As in the case of real numbers, you see? So, so again, um, you have to be careful when you are dealing with rings um, because here, in order to do that, you're going to say x squared minus x will be x into brackets x minus one, right? Is equal to zero, okay? So you're going to say uh, when you multiply them, either this is, uh, this is zero or that is zero. But it's possible for none of these to be zero and yet you have a zero, right? Okay, so, so we'll see that as well. So you can't, you can't make those conclusions straight away. So you have to be careful when you're dealing with, uh, when you're dealing with rings. Okay, good. Um, so now we'll do, um, we'll do some, um, let me um, put this in a, in a, in a larger view. Um, so, We'll see some examples. Before then, uh, these are some examples, some definitions that I was talking about, right? So we have a commutative ring. It's a ring uh, in which, you know, uh, multiplication is commutative. Then it is a special ring called a commutative ring. And it's a large class. Uh, most people just study commutative rings um, because there are a lot of interesting things in there. A ring with a multiplicative identity element is called a ring with unity, okay? Remember we said that for a ring, you don't need to have a multiplicative identity to call it a ring, all right? In the set, but if it does have a multiplicative identity, then it is called um, a ring with unity, okay? And that multiplicative identity element there, okay, is called the unity and is denoted by one, okay? Now be careful here because this one is a notation that just denotes the unity, the multiplicative identity, okay? It doesn't mean that every ring has, has an identity which is a multiplicative identity which is, which is one. So when we just say the identity of a ring, we mean the multiplicative identity. So keep that in mind. When we just hear the identity of a ring, we are not talking of the addition. We are always referring to the um, multiplication. Okay, so a ring can be, uh, for instance, matrices have uh, are rings as well, right? Um, n by n or two by two matrix. Those are rings, but the identity is not the number one. So this is just a notation to represent the unity, 
the modificative identity in a ring. So you have to be careful when you see one. So often we say one is not equal to zero. That means that the unity or the identity element is non-zero. Okay. So um, these are the usual candidates, all right, for a ring. Uh, the set of integers with multiplication, um, the set of real num uh, rational numbers, real numbers. These are commutative rings. Okay. So when you're taking out commutative rings, you can always think about these ones. Okay. And the unit is one. In this case, this one is the number one. Okay, um, so that is a unity. And the unity there, of course, as I said before, refers to the modificative identity element. Okay, good. I think I've explained this um, um, exhaustively. Let's take example six, okay? Now, so here is a set um, that is a commutative ring, but it has no unity, okay? So the set 2z, all right? The set of even integers, and of course addition and multiplication, that will be a commutative ring. Commutative because if I take any two elements, a times b is equal to b times a. Okay, um, so it's commutative, but it has no unity. The unity is such that if I have an element, um, the an identity element, and multiply it by any of this, I should get back that uh, element. There is no element like that in here. Okay. The only element that could do that is the number one, right? But the number one is not an element of the set 2z, okay? So this has no unity, even though it's a commutative ring, okay? So you see that we've seen rings with unity, and now we have seen um, commutative rings without, without unity. Um, um, example seven is also uh, uh, another example, right? There are whole chapters in some books on polynomial rings. Okay, here's an example of that. So a set of polynomials, right, given by this, where the a's here are the coefficients, they are real numbers, okay, and here positive. Okay, so this set here, the set of polynomials, where the coefficients are real numbers, they form a commutative ring, and they have a unity of one. This one is again the number one, okay? So now you could, as in example six and seven, you can actually check, check the axioms of a ring to, to see whether the axioms are satisfied. Abelian group, right? Multiplicative associativity, uh, left and right distributivity. So you can check these things. But for polynomial rings, you can do it, but it's very laborious. It's very, um, very, very uh, challenging, right? To actually go through all the axioms, but it can be done, okay? But keep in mind that the set of polynomials Okay, where um, the um, where the coefficients here are real numbers form an abelian, sorry, form a ring. Okay, and they are called polynomial rings. So keep that in mind. Um, also note that the notation here, okay, just means that um, this you see, with a square bracket means that you are talking of a ring, as opposed to let's say um, maybe a rational functions where you can write it as this. So rational functions will be um, the ratio of two polynomials, right? Where G and H here are the set of polynomials. So when you see this, in, we are talking of polynomials, but where the coefficients are real numbers. When you see something like this, then there's a set of, polynom set of polynomials, but the coefficients are integers, okay? Okay, so that is, um, you should keep that in mind. In mind. Okay, good. Now you can construct you can construct it with uh, different different coefficients. So in this particular example, we looked at coefficients that are real numbers. You can actually have coefficients that are complex numbers, or even um, even matrices. Okay, and they still form um, uh, polynomial rings. Okay, so that is what um, uh, this is trying to say. Okay, good. So we've seen. Um, some examples, here's another example, okay? So we've, we've seen commutative rings, okay? That have unity and commutative ring, rings without unity. Okay, we've seen those examples. We are gonna see a, a, um, an example of a ring that is not commutative, all right? And when you are thinking of non-commutative rings, think about the matrices, all right? The, um, because in general, commutativity, commutativity does not hold, right? Um, com multiplicative commutativity. When you say commutativity, we are talking of the multiplication. Again, keep that in mind. 
So it doesn't often hold in the in the in the uh, set of matrices two by two n by n matrices. So uh, keep that in mind. The set M two here, set of two by two matrices with integer entries, is a non-commutative ring with unity, and the unity here is not the number one. Of course, we are talking about matrices, so the unity is a unit matrix, right? This matrix is a unity in this set. Okay. Um, here it is easy to show why it is non-commutative, right? Because if you just pick these examples, these are classic examples. X is this matrix, Y is this matrix. If you multiply X um, by Y, you're going to have this element here, this matrix here. If you reverse it and multiply Y by X, you're going to get zero, the zero matrix, okay? So X times Y is not equal to Y times X. Therefore, it is not commutative, okay? Even though it's a ring, but it's a ring that is non-commutative. Okay. Remember, again, we said that to have a ring, you don't need commutativity. If there is commutativity, it's a special ring called commutative ring. If it is non-commutative, it can still be a ring. All right. Nonetheless. Okay, good. So that's an example of a non-commutative ring. Um, another set of examples that you will come across most of the time is a set of uh, integers modulo n, right? We've, we've seen this before when we're talking about groups. So the set of integers modulo n, this set here from zero to n minus one, these are, uh, if you like, uh, examples of finite rings, all right? We looked at finite groups and we use this as an example. They are also um, examples um, of finite rings, okay? So for, for example, Z2, which is zero, one, Z3, which is zero, one, two, these are examples of, um, of rings. They are finite because you know they have a countable number number of elements in the set. Okay, okay. So again, you are tasked to take a pen and paper and actually uh, go through the axioms. Make sure you satisfy your, satisfy yourself that these actually obey the axioms um, that we talked about. Okay. Okay, good. And um, here. This example 10 says the set S here, which has elements 0, 2, and 4, okay? And the integers modulo 6 is a ring with unity 4, okay? Right, note that the integers modulo 6 um, has elements, this elements, right? So let me, let me scribble something here. Um, so integers modulo, um, integers modulo 6, Z6, Right, we know Z6, Z6 um, has elements, what? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, five, right? So these are the elements of, um, of Z6, okay? Um, of course, the unity here is, um, is the number one, okay? If I take any number multiplied by one, I get the number back. So the unity is one in this case. Um, but here, the unity, there is no one here. It is, is this a ring? We'll see that it's, it's called a sub ring because it's a subset of this. But this is a ring, but the unity is not one. The unity is four, and that is what I'm demonstrating here. If I take any element and multiply by four of four times that element, I get the element back. Two times um, four or four times two, that is eight. Under modulus six, that is equal to two, right? So if I take four times two, I get two, or two times four, right? Uh, four times four, of course, is 16 under modulo six, right? I'm going to get four, you see? So if I take any element multiplied by four, I get the element back, two times four gives me two, four times four gives me four. And so four is the unity in the set, okay? Um, your task is show that, actually show that this is actually a rank, right? It's an abelian group. Note that when you are dealing with this um, integers modulo n, right, the, um, the additive inverse does not necessarily equal to the negative number, okay? It's any number that when you add it to a chosen number, you get the identity, which is zero. Additive identity, which is zero. So be careful about, about that. Even though you don't have negative um, numbers here, you, you still have additive inverses. And you can actually show that in the table, right? If you do, if you use, um, if you use um, addition, right? If you use addition, you have zero, uh, two, and four, for instance, okay? 
zero two four okay if they do this oops see bad let's do let's redo it now this this plus that is zero this plus that is two this plus that is four this is two this is four this is zero right two plus four is six under modulo six i get zero this and this is four this is a zero this is a two so you see if you take every element you get you get the identity in the column right so zero 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 so zero is the identity of zero uh two plus zero is two okay you see that two and then two plus four is zero so if you take two the identity the additive inverse i should say the additive inverse of two here will be four okay because if i add two to four i get the um additive identity which is zero out also the if i take four and add it to two i get zero where zero is the identity additive identity which means that the additive inverse of four is two okay so under modulus six or the modulus uh integers modulo n uh, you don't need to have negative um, negative numbers within the set in order to have an additive inverse. So keep that in mind. Okay, good. I think um, this is this is well explained. Okay, I'll probably um, so I'll end I'll end this uh, introductory um, part here. We've looked at um, in the first video. We looked at the definition of a ring, and now we've looked at some examples of rings. I'll come back and do a short video on the properties, basically a theorem, a very classic theorem when you're talking about rings. We'll do that and then we'll move on to uh, these other ones. Okay, so I'm going to end the, uh, this thing here. Now we'll go on later.